So I gather this quorum is a, um, it, it draws a mixture of, of, of people involved in all aspects of cardiovascular research, tech, industry, basic science, clinical, etc. And so I'm going to th keep things uh, very general. And the, the second reason I'm going to keep things very general is because when I saw the program, I saw it, an immediate and big problem. And that is that th there are lots of speakers here who are all true experts in their field, except one. And that is Edward Hickey, who is a surgeon at Sick Kids and is categorically not an expert on artificial intelligence. Um, but what I am going to do is, is give an overview of what it means, particularly from the clini clinician's point of view. Because if there's one message from all of this, is clinicians, we can see the clinical problems and need in front of us. We need the bridges built to the people, the few of you in this audience who are true experts in artificial intelligence, in order to give our data and our clinical problems and, and work in, in collaboration. That's really uh, what uh, we need. And from a clinical point of view, I work a lot in, in obviously in congenital heart disease, but particularly adults with congenital heart disease. And the problem we're faced is that they exhibit this very slow, insidious clinical de decline towards end stage heart failure. And that's a problem because at any one point in time, it's extremely difficult to tell when somebody's falling off a cliff. And that's even worse because we're really trying to uh, uh, to, to practice much more preemptive management at defined points in time rather than reactive management when a patient is clinically uh, obviously in trouble. When, people, when patients end up in trouble, <coughs> that makes our life much more difficult for both us and the patient. It's much higher risk. And underpinning all of this is the fact that we have huge gaps in our knowledge base. So this is really how we feel each week in clinical conference. We're standing in the dark trying to find our way in an area where we need, we need help. And on the other end, end of the age spectrum in neonates with congenital heart disease, the problems are much more acute and different but just as impactful. For a child, for example, born, newborn with an underdeveloped left side of the heart, we have to make a snap decision within the first few days of life whether you're going to abandon half of their heart and they're committed to a life with just one ventricle or alternatively try and do some sort of repair and utilize what you have. And if you get that decision wrong, it is a big deal for that child. It is a lifelong thing and, uh, and carries a high mor mortality cost. And from a conventional statistics point of view, us and me personally have done a lot of work in conventional statistical methodology, some of it complicated, like multi-phase parametric modeling and things like that. And we can, we can make prediction models using those techniques. We can take patient data and predict for any one child, is your survival likely to be better with one strategy or the next? But the thing is, it's still pretty crude. And once you've made that model, the model's made, and it's not updated unless you go through the whole scientific process again in recreating a new uh, model. As things get more complicated, so in adults with congenital heart disease, we have big cohorts of patients, but the immediate problem is that they're just so heterogeneous. These patients have come through decades of changing management strategies so that the, the adult in front of you is, is a, maybe a fossil of, of, of various different historic uh, methodologies which are not used in the clinical realm today. So from these big data sets that we compile, we can do the very conventional statistics like survival curves, things that we're all familiar with, and we can look at repeated data points, uh, things that we're all familiar with, looking at trends and what have you, but it is just so crude. We can show, for example, that the hearts get bigger with time and how fast or slow, they get bigger with time. But it, it, beyond that, we just don't have the fidelity. So in the clinical practice realm, our practice is incredibly crude. For this particular lesion, for example, if your heart is bigger than a certain size, then we commit you to a major cardiac reoperation. And if it's smaller than a certain size, we don't. It is that crude. And we need things to be much higher fidelity than we currently have. So as a, as a sort of data and stats sort of person in my academic life, over the past few years, and it has taken years, we've tried to preemptively build up a data repository moving towards a, a system where we can give the data to, to, to the brains behind machine learning and things. Uh, and 
it sounds like an easy exercise or, or why would you waste a few years and a lot of blood and sweat doing this? And it's because you, you, there's no other way of doing it. These patients from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, their charts are handwritten in paper. There is no electronic medical record. So other than by having armies of people going through and building these repositories, we simply don't have the data. In real time today, of course, we do with electronic medical records, but not for these uh, adult congenital uh, patients. And what we're really looking for is, the, is the, the depth of data. We want tons of clinical information on, on that cohort of patients, even if the cohort isn't that big. Whereas conventional registries in clinical medicine, the international registries and such like, historically have a very small sort of parsimonious set of information on that huge number of patients. And it's the depth of data that's so valuable. Operations, catheters, echoes, MRIs, ECGs, clinic visits, etc. And you can immediately see that it's just, it, it, you, you, you generate a huge complicated mishmash of clinical information. And then for us using conventional statistic, st statistical techniques, it's extremely challenging to, uh, to, to analyze these for what we see as huge data sets, not by, the, by, not by Google's uh, uh, standards, but these are nevertheless very big data sets for, for, for us uh, to work with. What we end up with is what I tend to call as, as clinical footprints. Uh, it's lots of time-related data at all sorts of different points in time, and you can plot them out. This is 56,000 data points on a cohort of, of, of patients with single ventricles, and you, you can't see any one data point because there are so many, but if I separate out just one patient, they have certain data points over time, and I can then arbitrarily flag these data points up as being very concerning, clinically abnormal, for example, and arbitrarily plot that on the y-axis. So I have a sort of a journey of one patient with very abnormal values over time, and I can plot a second patient, and then thousands, and then hundreds of patients, and you can see their sort of trajectory over time. And these are all patients who are well and clinically not in failure, but I can then superimpose patients who are in established Fontan heart failure, and you can see a very different trajectory. And th this is all very crude and arbitrary, but I immediately, from a clinician, can see the value in having these large repositories of data if only you could tease out the time-related risk of any one patient so that you can identify in clinic today who's at risk and, and, and who's not. And, and that concept is known as the hazard function. We all have a hazard function for life. This is, this is ours, the high risk of dying at birth and high risk of dying in old age. And I know you all want to know where this point is. Unfortunately for me, it's the age of 42, so I'm past that. But this is a, a common plot that life insurance companies uh, study uh, for obvious reasons. And for, a, for a, 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 a congenital heart disease patient, it, the hazard is much more like this. It's always high risk, and it'll fluctuate in time relating to various events that happen along the way, and it's very dynamic. And to, to get to the bottom of this type of risk profile over time will be extremely uh, valuable. Using conventional statistics, you can try, and we've tried, and this is what we call a dynamic risk score after a complex neonatal heart surgery. The ones in green lived and the ones in red died. And we can, tease, we can stratify relating to that dynamic risk score <clears throat> uh, for both clinical reasons and also for academic reasons to try and study who, wh how and why patients died uh, versus lived. But it's very time-consuming and laborious to do these types of analyses. So what about machine learning? Well, it's a hot topic, isn't it? If you do Google trend searches, the last few years, it's, it, it, it's flooded with, with, with searches for machine learning and artificial intelligence. It really is the sexy thing right now. But is it valuable for us as clinicians? Um, well, although it's a recent thing, it's not that recent. It's been, it's been around for many, many years. It's just caught everyone's attention now, I think, because data is so much more accessible. Even the concept of artificial intelligence is not new. This is the Pascaline. This is the uh, mechanical calculator built in the 1600s for addition and subtraction. So it's not a new concept. But in terms of machine learning, it really took off in the computer age. The concept being that software applications become more accurate over time without being explicitly programmed to do so. 
that's really the central crux of machine learning. And I first came across this uh, about uh, 12 years ago now when I met Richard Stroop, who was a data guy at Kansas Children's Hospital. And, and he wasn't always at Kansas uh, uh, Children's Hospital. He used to be the head of data mining at Applebee's. And I thought it extraordinary that a guy from Applebee's would go to a pediatric hospital. But it's because Kansas were just so insightful in terms of their new electronic medical record system, they realized this was a perfect opportunity for a big data computer guys to come and play with all the information in their system. And he set up an algorithm that was in fact embedded within their electronic me medical record system. And for a particular diagnosis where you're not, uh, you have a blocked, completely blocked pulmonary valve, a newborn presenting with this diagnosis would the, the algorithm would draw in other clinical information already in the electronic me medical record system, and from that would create survival predictions, and these predictions would be constantly updated in time as more and more patients came through. So this is a true machine learning algorithm. And I first saw this back in 2007 and thought this was just, this is amazing, way ahead of its time and way before that Google Trends jump in machine learning. And I still, of course, didn't and don't really understand the, 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 what happens in terms of the algorithms per se, but the concept is you take a training data set and pass it through these algorithms or mathematical models, and then the output needs to be classified as to whether it's sort of correct or, or wrong, and that needs some input of new data source, and from that, the algorithm can then be used in the future for making predictions. So for example, if you want to determine whether something is a pig or a camel, you can have a training data set, and the output needs to be labeled as to whether it's correctly a camel or a pig, and that needs some form of uh, an intellectual firepower to do so, so a human input, for example, um, and that's where the human level uh, comes into uh, machine learning. And in that regard, there are various then subcategories of machine learning. So a supervised is the, is the more common type where you have rules inbuilt uh, to help direct and classify the algorithms and the output. But there is also unsupervised learning, which sounds like a sort of chaotic anarchy where you don't have these rules. But the concept is that you're asking the algorithms to find patterns and trends within the data that you haven't preemptively identified. So the typical one, for example, would be cluster analysis, where it is looking for clusters of groups of patients, for example, who are very similar because of certain trends and also very different from other clusters. So as the algorithm runs, it will segregate out into these clusters. Or it may look for, for example, relationships between data that you haven't preemptively seen. So it's more, in some ways, it's a bit more exploratory. And in terms of these algorithms, this is where clinicians just glaze over. All these different types of things, neural networks and vector machines and decision trees, these are the things that clinicians just simply don't understand. And that's part of the problem with machine learning and AI. There's this black box concept about it that makes, feels, it makes us very unsettled as clinicians because we just don't understand it. Or, more to the point, do we even believe the output? Uh, we're giving data sets and then we get an output. Is, is that right? And so you need some way of comparing, perhaps, to conventional <coughs> statistics. And if you try and read around the literature to learn more about it, 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 it is almost counterproductive because you come across figures like this that are just meaningless to, to, to me. I, I, don't, I don't understand the concept at, at all. Or equations that maybe some, some of you in the room truly do understand this uh, equation, but it, it, it's meaningless to, to the clinicians. Instead, we need to just have the very basic concepts and then be put in the same room as the people who truly understand the ins and outs of the types of algorithms and how to apply. The concept, in a nutshell, though, that I and my simple surgical brain sort of understand is that you're asking the algorithm to make a, a prediction, and if it's wrong, it's punished, and so is less likely to do that in the future, and if it's correct, it's rewarded, and so as it runs and is progressively rewarded, it becomes more and more accurate in the same way as, as training uh, anything. Um, 
we often see diagrams like this, which is the levels of iterations as it passed through, each black line indicating a, a regression or, or computer or, or mathematical model to then produce the output layer, which is the, 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 the blue layer. Deep learning is the sort of the hottest, most recent part of artificial intelligence. It's really the boom that's happened in the last few years related to the sort of omic level data, whether it's genomic uh, level data or Facebook or Google level uh, data. And the concept is that it's multiple layers of these networks of algorithms trying to mimic the neuronal layer within our own brains of uh, neuronal um, connections and synapses and things. So after each layer, things become more and more high fidelity until you can actually identify accurately uh, and recognize a face. And this is, of course, Facebook's fa face re recognition software, which is a deep learning uh, enterprise. And it's not just Facebook, of course, it's now all around us. It's Uber, Google, etc. And what about us? Does it, is this meaningless or meaningful for, for clinicians? Well, I think we're going to see in the coming years that it's very meaningful. Uh, already, these are not journals that most clinicians would, would usually read, uh, but you, there are countless examples in the, in the uh, machine learning um, area, not so much the clinical domain, but in terms of the mathematical uh, and computer science domain behind it, of examples of validating it and applying it. So, for example, in this study of recurrent neural networks, so it's like that deep learning exercise, they're taking data sets, electronic medical records of lots of patients, who, some of whom develop heart failure and others who don't. And the plots on the right are the multiple deep learning um, layers of neural networks which were more accurate than logistic regression and other conventional machine learning techniques to predict heart failure and in fact predicted heart failure nine months earlier than the clinicians themselves uh, did. And of course, that's what we need in clinical medicine. We know that when things actually happen, there's been this pre-aura that is sort of setting the stage for the bad event to happen. And if only we can identify that accurately, we could stop things happening. So this is a cardiac arrest on, on sick kids uh, ICU using, tele using telemetry data from all of the monitors around. The monitors on an intensive care take data points every five seconds. And it, historically, that data would just evaporate. Each five seconds, it's gone, and then the next one comes around. And people quickly realize that if you can capture that data every five seconds, that is a massive amount of data to then study and look for the pre-aura, say, for a cardiac arrest. And here you can see that pulse pressure, the mean arterial pressure, uh, um, I'm not sure that we've got a pointer, but the, the three curves uh, near the bottom are getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And, uh, and, and that's the pulse width getting slowly, very, very slowly, slowly, slowly smaller until the child decompensates. And similarly here, this arrest here was billed as a sudden event in the chart. It's not sudden at all. If you go back through the, through the we call this T3 data, you can see a gradual decline. And if we had algorithms within, embedded within this, you could have, say, red flags picked up here as things are starting to deteriorate. And that's because we're not, as humans, we, we look at things in too granular a level. We get distracted by certain things which may be important, but we're missing the more subtle clues embedded within uh, the data. So at Sick Kids, uh, Jai and uh, Peter Lawson and Lawson Labs are already starting to work on this exact type of data, this T3 data, and are already using algorithms to predict cardiac arrest and also look for patterns within physiologic parameters like blood pressure and things. And it seems that AI is better than us at recognizing these patterns within huge amounts of, of data. And it's not just physiologic data, but if you look at telemetry of ECGs and such like, um, uh, it seems that models can outperform cardiologists in diagnostics of ECGs and arrhythmias. The pattern recognition side, just like facial recognition in Facebook, is, is, a, is a hot topic. It's uh, all over the medical literature at the moment, applying the same type of concept as Facebook to x-rays and CTs and scans and, and such like, and has led 
uh, to some predicting the, the, the uh, extinction of, of radiologists as a, as a specialty as things get better and better and better. And in, in that regard, not just in radiology, in the, in the realm of clinical cardiologists, and I'm sure there are some of you here involved in clinical imaging, uh, Gerhard Diller, who is a, a colleague of mine in the same specialty of adult congenital heart disease, who we really tried hard to, rec hard to recruit here and sadly isn't coming, but he would and should have been giving this talk because he's already starting to apply uh, AI to the diagnostics in congenital heart disease by taking echo scans and passing it through various algorithms and asking the, the algorithm to tell you whether this is a normal heart a heart with inverted ventricles or a heart with inverted great arteries using pattern recognition algorithms. And it was able to differentiate the three types of, uh, of uh, cardiac anatomy uh, with high fidelity. So perhaps this is the extinction, the start of the extinction of, of, of clinical imaging in, in cardiovascular disease as well. So back to my particular specialty, just to finish, if, if Fontan failure is an inexorable and progressive decline, in very, in, when you see a patient in, 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 at one point in time at clinic with a bunch of information, whether it's blood tests or physiologic data or, or, uh, or have you, and including imaging data like echo scans and, and heart function and such like, it's still extremely difficult for us to predict whether that patient is about to suddenly fail or has another five to 10 years before suddenly failing. And that, for me, is the value of, of uh, the potential value of machine learning and giving our big data sets and trying to answer these questions. And then if they are failing, there are three totally different strategies for managing that patient, each with their own risks. And in terms of helping to predict the best strategy for that one patient, I can clearly see the value of these algorithms. Um, I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much.